Welcome to the TCS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week, we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration, and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Hello, my name is Dr. Shalai Tambo, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I am a lecturer in Early Childhood Studies at Bath Spa University, an Associate Lecturer at the Open University, a Trustee for the Fatherhood Institute, and an independent writer, speaker, and consultant for Critical Early Years. Now, throughout this series, we'll be exploring representation in the early years, inspiring you with guidance on ways to be more inclusive in your practice through covering topics such as cultural and gender diversity. And on that note, I'm delighted to introduce Gina Rippon as today's guest. To round up our fourth and final episode, we'll look at how practitioners can, can communicate more effectively with parents and the local community to overcome gender biases. So Gina, how important is it that we work with parents as practitioners and get them on board um, when we're looking at gender inequality within our earlier settings? Absolutely crucial. <laughs> I mean, with respect to anything, I, I, I imagine practitioners have to get parents on board because whatever they do during the day or, or, or whatever their work time window is, if the children then go home to a family where they're getting different messages from people who are clearly the most important to them at this stage in their lives, then, you know, you're on a hiding to nothing. Um, I think right from the beginning, particularly when you're challenging stereotypes, um, because my experience of, of parents and um, I was part of the Fawcett Society's commission on looking at gender stereotypes in early years. And parents are crucial, obviously, to get on board. Parents have very strong opinions. Some of them are really, really keen to avoid gender bias. Other parents feel that. Uh, Gender, sex, gender differences are uh, natural, uh, shouldn't mess around. And of course, if you're dealing with a wide range of different ethnic communities within those communities, there are also very strong beliefs about differences between males and females. So unless you are aware of those and, and take them on board, um, however hard your gender champion works in the school or you know wherever it is they're working it is it, it, that's going to not work so from the beginning i think in, engage the parents um and i think that the parents themselves if they're willing they could also be made aware of their gender biases because sometimes parents are surprised about how they treat children differently without realising. There is an item in the No More Boys and Girls documentary we mentioned where um, it's, it's a sort of classic experiment. Um, you take a, a baby and dress it in you know, a little boy baby in girly clothes and a little girl baby in boy dungaree type things and give the baby to a stranger to play with. And the stranger who will probably say, I'm, you know, I'm completely gender neutral, will be busy making sure the little boy has a hammer and climbs up ramps and the little girl um, has a nice doll or a soft toy or something. And when you draw their attention to it, they are <laughs> universally surprised. You know, they I thought it was a little girl. And so even little things like that, parents don't notice, I mean, in their busy lives, especially if they've got more than one child, um, you know, just... It, 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 it's something that they don't notice. So, so those kind of aspects is important and engaging them in all sorts of things, even in school activities. Um, I got myself um, not that popular with a Christmas fair at my children's primary school when I complained about the fact that the presents being given out, you know, the, the Father Christmas or whatever the person giving the presents out had a sack for boys toys and a sack for girls toys and saying you know this is not <laughs> not the way we want to go and you do get the old oh, bit of eye rolling PC-ness so you then have to say that this is why it's important and I think that's the, the message this isn't just us being politically correct it's really important for children 
Um, and parents generally are really willing to engage. So giving them the opportunity to engage rather than just telling them we're going to be doing this in the school and, you know, on National Book Day or something, I you know, don't send your child dressed up as a stereotypical princess or whatever. You know, you engage them. And, and when you tell them it's National Book Day, you say, it might be nice if you thought of would somebody like to come dressed as something unusual, <laughs> for example. Um, so I think I think that's that's the important message. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I was talking to my students recently about National Book Day, just just gone this year. And even they who are in practice um, in nursery settings were seeing lots of the kind of gendered stereotypes still coming to the fore aggressively um, within, within their practice. So there's lots of dialogue, I guess, to be had between parents and practitioners to work together to ensure that in all aspects of the child's life, um, those gender stereotypes are suitably challenged. But you touched there on, on parents who might be less willing to engage um, or more cautious about these sorts of issues. They might say that I just want my child to be a child and if that means conforming to gender stereotypes, then, then so be it. How might you respond to, to those parents who are perhaps a little bit more cautious about gender stereotypes and the need to challenge those? I think one of the things I found is that if if they were if if they were even handed, as it were, I mean, one of the things that we've found is that parents are more relaxed about girls perhaps wanting to play with what are called boys' toys, but they get quite anxious if the boys want to wear dresses or dress up as princesses. So sometimes you have to say is is so if you want to keep this equal, why don't you mind if your girl plays with a toolbox or something, but you do worry if the boy wants to wear a tutu? So you have to be very careful, of course. Um, I mean, particularly if, as in some cases, maybe there's sort of um, cultural, even religious beliefs behind insisting on these differences. At some point, you have to respect those. And but you have to say, you know, where are we going with this? Do you think the world uh, is equally fair for boys and girls? And and look at, I mean, you don't need to be too preachy. Well, maybe you could be a bit preachy. I don't know. Um, yeah. So I I think it is. Um, if they say they just want their child to be happy, they say that's great. And it might be you say that well, they might be happy now, but later on. If they were never given the opportunity to do this, they might be less happy. Or, I mean, one of the interesting things with the, again, No More Boys and Girls documentary, they were asking, I think they actually cut it out in the end, that we were in the middle of Birmingham and there was a whole range of t shirts and there were things for little girls. Um, one of the, And the logos on the clothes and saying the messages that are sent out. So, a whole range of things like born to be a footballer's wife, you know, do you think that's appropriate? Mm. And some of them thought it was quite funny. And then you said, well, what kind of message do you think? But the one they didn't like was born to be underpaid, um, which, of course, <laughs> you could say, well, that's a social truth on a T-shirt there. Why wouldn't you put your daughter in it kind of thing? So sometimes humour helps, actually. <laughs> Yeah, some really interesting insights there. I think you're right to just acknowledge that there are, of course, cultural differences when we're talking about gender stereotypes, and, and we do absolutely need to respect those as much as possible. Yeah. We also need to be mindful that we are underpinned in our work by the Equality Act 2010. We do have that legal obligation to, to challenge those inequalities against those social characteristics. We'll just end with a final comment um, and reflection, Gina, on... If you were Prime Minister for the day, responsible for challenging gender in the early years, money was no budget, oh, what would be a priority for you and what would you do to really affect change? I, I would make, I'd, I'd follow the sort of Iceland rule, actually. And, um, and again, thinking about it, your comment about making it so important and making it matter more so it matters less. I'd be anxious about in, insisting there was a gender equality charter in every school because it then would emphasise it. But I think until we've been through that phase, um, I, I 
I don't think we're going to change anything. So I think I'd probably either be or appoint a minister of education, many, maybe a minister of gender, um, and insist that, that every aspect of society was challenged um, with respect to inequalities, actually. And, and that's probably important as well to say that we're talking about all kinds of inequalities. Uh, because a lot of people will say, you know, people of colour, for example, or people with disabilities or people with different sexual orientations. Um, so maybe it, it should be a, a general minister for a minister against, if you can have that, inequalities of any kind. Um, because sometimes people will say, quite rightly, maybe maybe disability is something we should be focusing on more than gender, for example, and therefore both both get lost. So if you had a kind of general overarching heading within which gender was embedded, but making sure people realise that it's not just political correctness. There are very bad things that happen when um, people are encouraged not to be themselves, people are encouraged to conform to stereotypes, which are can be very harmful. We should maybe, you know, focus on gender pay gaps, which again, of course, aren't gender pay gaps. Um, maybe we should actually have a, you know, make the World Economic Forum um, compulsory reading. So how, how are we doing every year as the UK narrowed its gender gap at all? You could set up some kind of competition. <laughs> Let's all be like Iceland. <laughs> Yeah, let's all be like Iceland, of course. And I think, um, you know, your comment on intersectionality is also really, really fundamental. And in future episodes, we will come to talk about anti-racism, neurodiversity and disability and how that all intersects with issues of, of gender in the early years. I think fundamentally, it'd be quite important that there was political consensus on these issues uh, as a fundamental starting point. It, it seems crazy that in the 21st century, this still seems quite a divisive issue. But that really also highlights the amount of work we've got to do to continue to implement gender inequality in the early years towards a more equitable and inclusive society. So I think that's a fantastic place to end this fourth and final episode with Eugenia. Thank you very much for your participation. I hope listeners will enjoy uh, the insights that you've shared throughout these past four podcasts. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I would like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Gina Vippen, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Shadai Tembo, and Gina Vippen. If you've been inspired by our conversation today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in our episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and accessing exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your settings and links to relevant resources.